So for those of you who don't know me, my name is John Howell. I'm the founder and CEO of Aviadev Africa. I'm going to moderate this session, which is going to really bring the industry leaders to the, uh, to the table to discuss what's happening in the world of aviation in Africa. Um, Aviadev itself is the largest platform on the continent, offering um, a platform to discuss air connectivity to, from, but most importantly, within the continent of Africa. It began life actually alongside the Africa Hotel Investment Forum, which is why it's absolutely brilliant that obviously we're doing this together as a group, that the hotels, the hospitality, the aviation industries are all working together. And of course, in the current environment, rebuilding air connectivity and getting people traveling again is going to be vital for all the industries. It's the lifeblood of, of, of tourism and of commerce. And, and um, you know, we wouldn't be where we are today without, uh, without aviation. So as I say, it's great to obviously be, be with you and to join forces. Now, before we start the panel session, what we thought would be a good place to start for those of you who aren't aviation experts and those of you who want a real kind of up-to-date uh, up to date overview of exactly what's happening today, we wanted to provide a bit, a bit of context, a bit of data. So I'm going to introduce my, my colleague, um, Ogadja Ujo, who is the regional partner at Africa for Aviadev Consult, our boutique um, consultancy for route development. And um, he has worked for Comair Limited, South African Airways, Qatar Airways in roles that have formed part of research, commercial and strategy functions. So what he's going to present to you now is just some brief insights on the supply side data and how to structure ourselves for recovery. So uh, Ogadji, you, you, please join us on the stage. He's on his way. There he is. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, John, for the uh, introduction. As mentioned, my name is Ugago Ujo, uh, part of the Avia Dev Consult team. Um, and we're just briefly going to uh, take you through some information um, around where we stand from a data perspective and just a few salient features to open up the conversation. So at this stage, I'm just going to share my screen. And please do tell me um, if you can see everything. Um, let's do this. Um, is, is it visible? Sorry, I just want to check that. Okay, so apologies for that. So this is really just a brief a discussion to open up with our esteemed panel on, on where we are from a data perspective. Um, we'll briefly look at um, the road to restart. So, you know, what the data tells us thus far, uh, defining ourselves for recovery, as well as structuring ourselves and just a few key takeouts to really open up the discussion. Um, as John mentioned, this is the team um, and we do have a booth. So please do join us um, when you have some time. So really, what the data tells us so far, what we decided to do uh, is look at um, data all the way from the beginning of last year, 2019, right until um, quarter three of this year. So a little bit ahead of where we are today. And we took a snapshot from last week. And just to set some context, um, you know, experts are telling us that from an African COVID exposure perspective, we are still really um, dealing with this. Um, we're still at the beginning or, or towards the middle of where we are. Some countries haven't peaked yet. As of yesterday, we had about 720,000 cases. Um, and we're also, of course, starting to see the economic impact with projections of 1.8% uh, continent-wide um, reduction in GDP. And having a look at the data, I think the trajectory is quite clear. Um, Half year capacity, so from January to uh, June of this year versus last year, was down 39%, which equates to about 31 million seats. Um, and COVID restrictions across the continent were really strictest uh, around quarter two of this year, which is um, when March hit. So that was really when we saw the, the tightest uh, reductions really um, in capacity due to several countries uh, implementing hard lockdowns where uh, borders were effectively closed for periods. Um, and from, from quarter two to quarter three, we tentatively are starting to see the beginnings of restart in the sense that 
uh, with some uh, restrictions being eased, borders are sl slowly being opened across the continent and capacity is slowly being put back in certain respects. And here we actually see the differences between, uh, you know, the regional blocks in, in, in Africa with North Africa right at the top in grey. Um, the largest half-year variance from a capacity perspective has actually been Southern Africa, where we are based, um, about 44% lower than last year. And going forward, uh, at this stage, it does seem that restart is being driven from a North African perspective, with the lowest variance of about 30% um, in capacity, driven very much by Tunis, Tunisia and Egypt. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, Tunisia, of course, was, was, has opened up its tourism uh, um, the economy in the last few weeks, of course, with, with uh, several protocols, and given the catchment and proximity it has to Europe, they are catching some of the peak of, of that uh, summer traffic. And looking a little bit more granularly, um, we've taken a week view, so this, this is from until last week, um, really looking at what does the week uh, trajectory look like in terms of published capacity. Um, and we've taken about a, a few markets, namely Egypt, Tunisia, Ghana, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kenya, South Africa, and Mauritius. Um, and uh, we've really tracked, uh, you know, what capacity looks like. Um, and again, we see a lot more closely that March was really tough for, for every market when restrictions were just um, really, really the toughest. Um, Tunisia, in this case, if we take last week's capacity, Tunisia is actually at 40% of where its 2019 capacity was for the same time last year. Uh, you will also see some almost 100% um, negative uh, views given that both Mauritius and South Africa actually had a few weeks of no scheduled activity given the very tight and stringent restrictions um, that were placed on those respective markets. And of course, we know that the view on demand is really the great unknown. And we'll talk about a little bit about this in the next slides. Uh, but demand, what it looks like, um, its, its makeup will really be influenced by quite a few variables, some that we have dealt with in the past, but also, of course, new variables as well. And in, in really defining what our recovery looks like, we've, we've kind of structured this into three spheres. So there's a customer expectations perspective, there's an internal process perspective, specifically in terms of airlines and airline businesses, and of course, cooperation. On the customer expectations, there's no doubt that uh, we will need to, as airline decision makers, we'll need to really understand and actually invest in um, understanding the behavior of customers. And at the same time, we have to position ourselves and sometimes educate our, um, our clients um, based on their behavioral um, understanding of, of where we are and safety of travel. I think in this COVID period, there's been some really interesting things that we've seen already. Um, strategic partnerships have been set up by a few airlines. Um, Etihad is an example where they set up the Etihad Wellness Program, which is really a sanitation uh, program safety program, but it's got 13 initiatives that is really aimed at softening kind of the harsh view of what these safety protocols look like. I mean, they even call uh, their employees, you know, a wellness ambassadors to try and socialize the new norm that we're in. Saudi Airlines and Dettol actually struck up a strategic partnership as well, where they're providing branded products on board uh, to really, again, push the narrative of it is safe to travel with us. And United also um, established a relationship with two health companies in the same regard. From an internal process perspective, um, really this is about the airline businesses themselves. Uh, perhaps controversially, we have heard quite a few views of it's important to ignore the historics, data from the past doesn't matter anymore, and we actually don't agree with that view. The baseline certainly still has some value. However, with that said though, there will be some new elements that you know, airline decision makers will have to take into account. This could include COVID-19 spread, it could include heat maps on travel restrictions and quarantine restrictions. Um, it may also include um, elements such as customer confidence indices, and these layers of data will now impact how uh, airlines plan the way forward. And I think what's quite important from an internal process perspective, specifically in the African context, is that we need to have a strategic approach to flexibility and risk management. In other words, what if scenarios, what if scenarios, what if scenarios. Um, airlines need to understand the buffer that they have and plan for that and plan various scenarios because as the days go by, we will get new data that tells us how we can potentially position ourselves going forward. 
And really the last um, uh, element in this is really around cooperation. And as someone who's obviously quite invested in the African aviation market, I think this is a sphere that we've done exceptionally well on. And I look forward to our esteemed panelists talking about uh, the various cooperation across the, the industry. But really just to highlight to, to, to businesses and stakeholders, it's really about um, understanding the cooperation, not just within the aviation and tourism industry is important, but actually across. And I think we can take examples of how some airlines have partnered with different businesses to move uh, the needle in terms of restarting the businesses. And of course, active stakeholder management is critical to this cooperation. So we urge that uh, airlines and airline businesses actively map out who are my stakeholders? How do I need to engage with them? What is the objective of this engagement? And of course, from an airline perspective broadly, these stakeholders include shareholders, employees, banks, lessors, OEMs, regulators, and industry affairs groups. And maybe just on the point of OEMs, um, I think a notable example of cooperation is how Embraer have actually positioned um, the safety element of traveling. I'm talking about the HIPAA system and going out on a very strong marketing campaign to actually support uh, airline clients. And, and all of this uh, structuring and trying to define what recovery means for ourselves it really must be driven by the strategic use of data assets to drive insights and decision making. Um, it's very much about applying discipline and focus in how as, as businesses we position ourselves forward and also acknowledging that, you know, the airline next door to me might be in a different context to where I am as well. In, in closing, there are a few key takeouts that we have. So uh, at a continental level, as we've mentioned, quarter two of 2020 was the lowest point uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic due to the March restrictions imposed. Uh, positively, as some restrictions have eased, the published capacity does seem to be uh, higher in North Africa than, than other markets, uh, linked to probably European summer and, and other factors as well. Um, in driving recovery, we just want to mention again that airline decision makers, we should normalize a strategic approach to flexibility and risk management through utilizing uh, data assets and investing in those data assets. And probably which is most important is there's a co-creation element that we have in uh, restarting and a cooperation element as well, not just within our industry, but across the industry. And we just think that these few points would assist us in the discussion. And as we open up the panel floor to our esteemed panelists and driving the way forward from a, a sustainability perspective with regards to COVID-19 and our response. Uh, thank you very much, John, handing over to you. Thanks, Ogaga. Yeah, some real food for thought there in terms of uh, some of the some of the things you've presented. And obviously, it's the real up to date data. So we're seeing a bit of bit of um, a bit of recovery being driven. So now I want to bring our panel to the stage, um, and I'd like to invite Raphael Cucci to to join us um, first. First of all, now for those of you, many of you do know Raphael. He's the IATA Special Envoy to Africa on aeropolitical affairs. He's got many years experience in air transport management operations and consulting as well. Currently, he's the um, he's the, the, the special envoy. And in, in that role, he's leading IATA's engagement at a very high level with top government regional industry leaders and also advocating the benefits of this thing, the, the single African air transport market, the latest incarnation of the Yamasuko decision or open skies for Africa. Um, so uh, I think Raphael is about to join us, hopefully. Uh, just uh, click on that button in the top corner, Raphael, and uh, you'll be with us. Let me give you a second. Or we can move on. Yes. Here okay. we go. We've got you, Raphael. Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you. So I wanted to, we've just seen some numbers from Ogaga. We've seen some numbers. Uh, you know, uh, over the last few months. Is aviation itself facing an existential crisis or is that too strong a statement? Uh, well, uh, good afternoon to your listeners and viewers across the world. And thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to join you on this conference. Uh, indeed, the aviation industry globally, not just in Africa, is facing an existential threat. And um, for Africa, what makes it the situation even worse is that prior to COVID-19, the industry had not been in really good shape. The industry had had significant uh, challenges uh, dating back several years. And um, if uh, viewers would recall, uh, in, in over 10 years, 
the African aviation industry collectively had not made profits. And then added to it, now we have this crisis. So as we speak now, many of the airlines uh, across the continent are in their need of financial support to be able to uh, continue the existence uh, going into the future. In fact, the, the, the statistics of the situation prevailing now in Africa are very telling. If you look at flight operations, they are down 95%, the number of flights that are currently operating. They're reduced to only 5% of the flights operating. If, if you convert that into uh, what we estimate to be the loss that the, air, the African airlines will incur in terms of revenue for the year 2020 compared to 2019, they are expected to lose about $6 billion in terms of revenues. Now, if you look at, at the, 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 in terms of the traffic, passenger traffic is expected to fall by 51% compared to the figures in uh, 2019. Now, but what is more telling is if you look at the, the potential risk of jobs, about 3.1 million jobs are at risk of being lost in this industry. And in terms of GDP contribution to uh, the African economies, this is uh, the, the, the uh, risk of GDP contribution is about 28 billion. So if you look at all of this situation, uh, it is actually a, a significant impact that COVID has brought to bear on the African aviation industry. However, why I believe uh, the African continent cannot afford to allow aviation to uh, disappear on the continent is that there are some significant benefits that aviation has brought to, uh, brings to the continent, as, and, and some of which I have already alluded to. But look, the continent is big with 1.5 billion people, 1.3 billion people. Now, uh, of this number, just a small fraction, under 12%, are currently travel by air. So the potential for air travel is huge. What is more, the, the, the African youth and the middle class is growing and growing rapidly. So a lot, of, a lot more Africans have disposable income that they can spend on travel. And so the industry is needed to be able to support this. Besides businesses, and as uh, Ogaga mentioned, businesses on the continent would need aviation to be able to continue to uh, uh, thrive. And the, the, the critical thing is that what would happen to the single African air transport market dreams? and the Africa continental free trade area dreams if aviation disappeared. So it is in the interest of the African stakeholders to ensure that aviation thrives and goes beyond COVID-19. And finally, to, to my point, look, what we the, the, the industry is expecting is that, like we are seeing happening elsewhere around the world, we want African governments and the African Union Commission and other international funding agencies to come to the aid of the African aviation industry. And how? We want them to come through direct financial injection. We are seeing across the world in some uh, jurisdictions, in the Americas, for instance, the American government has given 61 billion US dollars to the uh, aviation sector in that country. We have seen France has given some seven billion or so to F, to support Air France and the industry. The, the Dutch government has done the same, and we're seeing this in many other places. We want the African governments to come in and support strongly the aviation industry through cash injection to start with. Secondly, we want them to also support the industry by giving the industry access to loans and guarantees for loans so that they can be able to access loans to complement whatever they can get from governments. And thirdly, we want governments to at least either defer some of the uh, eminent payments that airlines need to make to financial institutions or to tax authorities to the future, 
or just waive those um, taxes so that the airline can be able to have some breathing space um, to, to move on. We have been informed that the African Union Commission has mobilized some 12.5 billion US dollars to support the, uh, the industries on the continent, not just aviation, but other industries as well to, uh, during this, this crisis. We have been told also that the African Development Bank has mobilized some $10 billion for a similar as a whole. And again, African Exim Bank has mobilized $3 billion to support this. What is critical for the industry at this stage is we are losing time. The longer we take to disburse this funding to these entities, the likely the chance that by the time we begin disbursing, we would not have these airlines um, in existence. But definitely, African airlines and African aviation will live beyond uh, COVID and would emerge from COVID even much stronger. And my conviction is because we are seeing South African Airways being reorganized, we are seeing Kenya Airways being restructured, and we think that these will come up much, much more stronger than we have seen to date. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Yeah, the pandemic definitely gives us an option. Um, Raphael, can you just mute on your side for getting a bit of feedback? That would be great. Well, if you can just hit the microphone. There we go. Perfect. OK, so I'm sorry about the sound quality there, everybody else. But yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, 3.1 million jobs lost. Uh, we need the money and we need it now. And this is why it's a good time to bring in um, Mr. Abderrahman Berte, who is the Secretary General of the African Airlines Association. He's been uh, the Secretary General there just over two years, and he brings over 28 years experience in the airline industry and 16 years as an airline CEO in West Africa as well. So bonjour, Monsieur Berte. And um, I, I think what everybody wants to know, we've heard about the, the, the issues that are obviously affecting aviation as a whole, but you obviously have a membership base. What are you doing right now to support your members with this? Is it just a case of getting this money injected as quickly as possible? Bonjour, John. It's good to see you speaking French. <laughs> I'm uh, trying. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone, uh, depending on where you are. Thank you for organizing uh, this uh, session and uh, inviting me uh, to speak. AFRA has been um, working uh, closely with uh, key stakeholders uh, since the beginning of this uh, pandemic and uh, uh, looking for workable solutions for uh, resilience uh, to the pandemic and for post-recovery efforts. And uh, we are uh, making a uh, monthly assessment of the situation our last assessment was issued in uh, July, and uh, we have estimated uh, a loss of $8.6 billion for the African airline industry for the year 2020, on the assumption that uh, we'll see a recovery, 30% uh, of recovery of traffic during the third quarter. And uh, at the end of this year, 65% of uh, uh, recovery. The capacity uh, drop uh, for June is 76% uh, for African airlines, and uh, um, the traffic drop 89%, and uh, the cargo capacity drop for May is 39.4%. Uh, so those figures are telling, uh, very important. On uh, April, on 20th of April, AFRA has organized a webinar on uh, navigating COVID-19 pandemic and preparing for recovery post-crisis. We come up with a recovery plan for our members. This recovery uh, plan contains nine pillars. Those pillars are uh, actions uh, uh, toward government and states, uh, regulators, suppliers and uh, service providers, customers, maintenance and uh, MROs, cost management, cargo operations, human resources, and strategies to maintain business uh, continuity. Um, the recovery plan requires a coordinated uh, effort and collaborative uh, approach with all stakeholders to uh, ensure survival and business continuity 
uh, of the industry. We also made an appeal on 18th of March to uh, civil aviation ministers, compared to finance ministers in Africa, to appeal uh, for support for uh, the aviation uh, sector. In uh, May also, we made another appeal with other stakeholders like IATA, UNWTU, EASA, uh, to uh, call for support to the travel and tourism sector and to call uh, for putting in place a $10 billion support for those uh, sector, sectors. And AFRA has contributed to the uh, working groups of uh, African Union Commission, the High Level Tax Force, uh, which was uh, set up in uh, May. And uh, the High Level Tax Force made some recommendations at, on the financial uh, domain, uh, asking for state to put aviation sector as a priority. Because today, as I said, Rafael, there are some support from African Union, from FDB, but those are uh, support to uh, uh, government budgets. We are not sure that uh, those uh, support will be uh, uh, channeled uh, to uh, African uh, airlines. And also one of the recommendations of the high level tax force was to put in place a fund of uh, $25 billion to support the uh, aviation uh, sector in Africa. Liquidity uh, is uh, today a crucial uh, issue in Africa. We are facing a liquidity crisis uh, in uh, Africa. We made a survey with uh, uh, UNECA, and according to the survey, we had uh, 16 airlines which responded to it. And uh, we estimated the indebtedness of uh, those 15 airlines for 2020 and 2021 at uh, $3.2 billion. But this is just part of uh, the financial needs for African uh, airlines. And um, we staged a webinar on 4th of June on financial support to the African airline industry in the context of COVID-19 pandemic and ongoing effort to engage with development finance, uh, finance institution and donors for potential support to African airline. AFRA will continue to seek more avenues to support African uh, airlines industry, but really today uh, we can say that so far we are talking about uh, the need to support financially the aviation sector, but we are not seeing uh, airlines getting uh, apart from state finance, getting any support uh, uh, at, uh, from uh, uh, international financing institution. This is a worry because uh, to restart business, many airlines will need uh, some cash uh, because uh, they are really in a very difficult situation and uh, some may be go to insolvency or uh, even uh, bankruptcy. Also, uh, with other stakeholders, uh, uh, AFRA, uh, including IATA, AFRA urged the ICAO Council uh, to take a decision to use only 2019 emissions for the determination of Corsia's baseline. I'm happy to say that the Council of ICAO has accepted this uh, proposition. It will allow emissions to stabilize at pre-crisis level from 2021, ensuring that ICAO's aspirational target can be met without imposing an inappropriate economic burden on international aviation. For resumption of uh, airlines operation, ICAO Council has issued the CART report and CART takeoff guidelines. At AFRA, we have communicated to our members. We even have worked out an infographic uh, uh, document for our members to better explain what uh, those measures are about. But uh, the guidelines from the uh, ICAO Council are a baseline, in fact. So it's very important for African continent because there are so many countries to harmonize uh, the measures across country. 
uh, because today we can see, for example, the requirement from one state to another state uh, regarding the health screening, the COVID-19 health screening situation, you are facing different uh, uh, measures from one state uh, to another. So it's very important to coordinate and to harmonize. And also something very important is uh, to uh, coordinate the reopening of borders because we have many countries, if some are opening and others are still closing their borders, it will be a problem. If you look at uh, today uh, in the world, uh, many uh, regions have started flying uh, in intra regions, but uh, the sky in Africa is still uh, empty. So we need to, to speed up the return to uh, flights. And uh, also I think that uh, African airlines will need uh, to restructure, to, uh, uh, to look at uh, rethink their business, the fleet, and also the, the network. AFRA uh, is offering services through the consultancy, AFRA consultancy service to assist the airline to uh, perform this uh, restructuring. Also, because uh, the uh, uh, recovery will be slow, it will be very important uh, to cooperate so that we can have a very good level of connectivity within the African continent. Afri AFRA mm -hmm. will organize in the uh, end of September a meeting with its member to see how they can better co cooperate commercially to have a very good uh, uh, connectivity uh, within uh, Africa. Um, to, uh, to conclude, uh, I have a big concern because uh, those last days, we are seeing the number of cases in Africa on the rise. This is a big concern uh, because maybe some countries will come back to lockdown and maybe also African continent will maybe ban uh, from traveling to other regions uh, on the world. So we really need to work on it. The only way uh, for me is to strictly apply the protocol uh, so that we bring confidence to among customers, but among also uh, other regions and other stakeholders within the world. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Merci beaucoup. And um, yeah, absolutely. Aviation's a really difficult, difficult industry at the best of times. Africa, as both of you have said, was already struggling and then COVID has, has really hit it for six and it's that speed of it's that speed of injection of, uh, of financial support that we need so i'd like to bring um, bring chris into the conversation now so for those of you who who don't know um chris weigenthal is the uh, chief executive of the airlines association of southern africa he spent 13 years with uh, south african airways many many years ago not that many though chris uh, you're not not that not that old um and he's very active at the moment supporting the growth and sustainability of the airlines in southern africa he works with Afra. He works with Ayata, which is why he's great. He's great. He knows these guys very well, and all the stakeholders in Southern Africa, including being a director on the Tourism Business Council of Southern Africa, as, uh, South Africa as well. So, Chris, just quickly to come to you, um, there's been obviously massive turmoil in Southern Africa as a as a as a whole, and is this the most challenging period of your tenure so far? And how do you feel the landscape is kind of shifting and changing? And where are we going? Well, thank you, John, and thank you for the opportunity to, to join you and, and to speak here. Yes, certainly, I think aviation has been the first major casualty to the, with the effective overnight prohibition of uh, domestic and international air traffic in, in Africa and obviously around the world. And uh, while understanding, I think, the necessity of the lockdown um, and uh, all the measures, the consequential impact on aviation, travel and tourism has actually been devastating. So you're absolutely right. The landscape has changed completely already and probably will um i, I don't know if the our life will ever be the same again it'll be we, we're obviously into a totally different environment and having gone through all the lockdown and uh and as business now begins to open up as my colleagues have started to talk about in certain areas they're starting to open up i think we as an industry have to start moving from a position of zero activity and the only way is up so if we look at the way forward with in terms of 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 um of, of how we can change the landscape and how we can move it for the better. I a couple of thoughts around that is firstly, our airlines do need to survive. 
and they do require the financial assistance that both Rafael and Abdur have actually spoken about, either through state funding or through private investment. And we're supporting our airlines with, their, uh, with approaches to government for support in that area. I think an interesting um, comparison is that in the US, Europe, and other parts of the world, we've seen governments providing airlines with rescue funding in return for equity in some areas. But in Africa, I think this is probably a bit more difficult because um, I'm not sure that governments have with small tax bases and other priority demands that they have to sort out the, the health and poverty areas and those priorities that they can actually assist um, in the, as much as I think is required. And I think the, my colleagues have highlighted the, the huge necessity and the huge cash requirement because of the lack of performance of the industry as a whole in Africa. But one consideration, maybe you throw something controversial into the process, is that we could probably look at um, governments considering a change in policy in certain areas where, where you remove the ownership and control caps and allow, for example, um, direct foreign investment to come in from private, private sources. And obviously that's controversial and it's probably something that we've all spoken about and, and shied away from, but I think we're now moving into a different era and maybe some new and different thinking is required in that area. Secondly, I think the most important aspect is that we have to open up aviation. And I'm hearing, obviously, the issues related to the problems of, uh, of the, the rising cases in Africa, and that's obviously a concern. But I think that in, in this area, our, air, our industry is certainly the most regulated and compliance-focused industry in the business. And protocols and standard operating procedures have been put in place, and they've been approved by the um, authorities using the guidelines presented by World Health Organization, ICAO, and other organizations like that. And Dr. Moeti actually mentioned that earlier on in the discussion on World Health Organization. So I think from a domestic, regional, international perspective, we're ready to fly. And aviation, travel, and tourism must open up together because they work together in harmony. And so our partners and our partners have got those protocols in place to ensure that those risk mitigation measures are in place and that we can ensure the safety and health and well-being of our passengers. Also, there are other measures that one can take, such as um, trying to reduce costs to the airlines in terms of uh, leasing and finance costs and the implementation of the Cape Town Convention, which has only been implemented in a number of states in Africa, is an area that I think we need to accelerate. And also then another area is the AU should now consider, and I know that some of you, Raphael and Abdur are very are, are very uh, involved, is the implementation of the African continental free trade area and the implementation of the single African air transport market. That we can start, we can use the time that we, there's not as much activity. A mutual interest of all the airlines across the continent. They're certainly essential to um, Africa's recovery, economic recovery. And thirdly and finally, I just want to mention that as members of the public and leaders of the industry and all the participants in the industry, we have to trust the science and we have to be disciplined in our approach to do the basics right. Just wearing the masks, social distancing, sanitization, washing hands. And we've got to do the necessary right. If a government sees a lack of discipline, then they will remain cautious and will not lift the restrictions which we are so desperate to see. But I think in, 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 in general, we're ready to go and, and hopefully we can work with governments to ensure the opening up of our industry and travel and tourism accordingly. Thanks, thanks John. Thanks, Chris. And yeah, we've, we've got some sessions this afternoon, one of which is completely focused on restoring travel to confidence. So we're going to talk about that with practitioners from both the airport side, the airline side. You know, we want everybody to be involved in those conversations this afternoon. So our, our final panelist um, today, and I wanted to bring Sanjeev in last because he's uh, he, he might have a more positive story to tell, and it's nice to uh, it's nice to bring somebody in who's got something positive to say. Now, um, Sanjeev's based in Nairobi. He's the CEO of Astral Aviation, which is the largest private cargo airline in Eastern Africa, and it's 20 years old. This year, so happy birthday to Astral, uh, Sanjeev. Um, he also serves as vice chairman of the, uh, the African Airlines Association Cargo Task Force and vice president of TIAC, the Air, uh, International Air Cargo Association. So, Sanjeev, many people are saying due to COVID, the cargo business has actually done better than ever. Um, is that true? Will it last? And should airlines out there be quickly converting their planes to freighters? John, thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon from Nairobi. 
uh, the Ekanku industry has had a fantastic growth during the pandemic as it was the only part of the supply chain which was dependable and reliable for the transportation of PPEs, test kits and ventilators with thousands and thousands of tons which were lifted from China to the rest of the world on cargo aircrafts and also on passenger converted aircrafts. In the case of Astral Aviation, we have experienced a 50% growth in our network as we are now flying to 15 destinations every week and have also doubled our fleet in the past three months. We've had a number of challenges, John, relating to crew quarantine restrictions and also accessibility to certain countries in Africa. However, these were quickly resolved. We're expecting that the industry will slow down over the next three months, and uh, this, will enable anal uh, this will enable airlines to focus on their pre-COVID strategy. However, there will be a further surge as soon as the COVID vaccine has been tested and ready for distribution as we anticipate that the transportation of vaccines will be the biggest air freight movement in the world, which will take between three to six months and will involve a number of supply chain combinations and collaborations between all sectors. In 2021, we expect the air cargo industry will, require, will recover faster compared to the passenger industry. And I'm very confident for recovery by the middle of the year, which is 2021. However, this will depend on how the rest of the world will be able to come out of the pandemic and restart their economies. That's fantastic. That's really great. And I'm watching the uh, I'm watching the event and the stage chat. And um, I'm very conscious of the time, unfortunately. And Matt needs to. We have the uh, the Minister of Tourism and um, Wildlife from Kenya uh, waiting in the wing. So I'm going to bring Matt Matt back in. So. I want to thank you all today. What I would also ask you to do is stay on the platform. And those of you who've got questions, we'll, we'll collate these, we'll pose them. We maybe will run another webinar off the back of this as well. But you can connect with, um, with, the, with the individuals and our panelists uh, off, offline here today.